Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be thinking about pressure differences inside and outside spherical bubbles and balloons. This pressure difference is known as the Laplace pressure. Now we'll consider a couple of different but very closely related scenarios throughout the video. The first scenario we're going to look at is the one that I've already sketched out where we just have some liquid, so let's say a large container of liquid and within that liquid we have a bubble of gas. So I've indicated that there's a pressure of P out in the liquid and a pressure of P in within the gas bubble itself. The question that we're ultimately wanting to answer in this video is how are those two pressures P out and P in related? Now before we launch into doing a calculation it's worth taking a moment to just make sure it makes sense why P out and P in are actually different in the first place, why they're not just the same pressure. The reason is ultimately that there is a surface tension at the interface between the liquid and the gas and that surface tension is a force which has a tendency to pull the bubble inwards and make it collapse and so in order not to collapse there needs to be some excess pressure inside pushing the bubble back out and so we already know just from that intuition that P in should be bigger than P out. Once we've solved this we will briefly consider the related case of a bubble made of a thin film like for example a soap bubble floating through the air um, but in order to understand the solution for that case you first have to understand this solution so this is where the bulk of the work is going to be. The way I'd like to approach this is by considering the balance of forces um, on one particular area element uh, on the surface which forms the interface between the gas and the liquid. So you'll see that I've already drawn on that area element, it's this thing here, and I've also added dashed lines going from the origin to each of the four corners of that element and also to the center of the element. And then in gray, we've got the projections of all of those um, dashed lines down onto the xy plane. Those are going to be useful for defining some of the parameters um, of this area element. Given the symmetry of this system, it's natural to want to introduce spherical polar coordinates. So let's do that. And let's start by saying that this point here, the center of our area element, is a distance r away from the origin, which is equivalent to just saying the radius of the bubble is r. Let's also say that that central point has angular coordinates theta and phi as defined in the usual way. So theta is the angle measured downwards from the z-axis like that, and phi is this angle that I'm marking on there. So the angle measured uh, in the xy plane relative to the positive x-axis. And to describe the physical extent of that surface area element, we're going to introduce small increments in both theta and phi. So d theta is going to be this angle that I'm marking on there. Let me write d theta there. And d phi similarly is going to be that angle down there. So just small increments in theta and phi. There is no dr because this is a, a surface area element rather than a volume element, so it's only two-dimensional. So I've just drawn out another copy of that area element over on the right, um, but this time included some of the forces that are acting on it. I've labeled them F1, 2, 3, and 4. Now those forces are coming from the surface tension in the liquid that is surrounding the bubble, right? Basically the, the molecules in the liquid at the interface are going to be pulling our little area element in all directions. So note that F1 and F2 act in the theta direction, while F3 and F4 act in the phi direction. What I haven't shown here is the additional forces from the pressure difference that are acting in the radial direction. There's going to be a net outwards force in the R direction coming from the fact that the pressure inside is bigger than the pressure outside. Now given that our area element is in equilibrium, it's not moving around, what we need to do is find the radial components of F1 to 4 and balance the resultant of those radial components with the outwards radial force coming from the pressure difference. So we're going to have to do some geometry to resolve all of those forces uh, along the relevant direction. To help with that, I've drawn a new view of that same area element from the edge on and just shown the forces F1 and F2. We'll deal with F3 and F4 later. I will note now though, um, just to help you visualize what this diagram means, that F3 and F4 would sort of be pointing in this kind of direction that I've just marked on there, but we'll come back to that later. You'll also see that I've marked on this d theta over 2 angle um, straightforwardly in the middle because we said that the entire extent of the area element in the theta direction was d theta, um, and by symmetry uh, that angle that I've marked on is just half of that. So what we really need uh, is to get the angle between F2 and the tangent vector, in other words this one here, um, and so this is the angle we're aiming for, because as soon as we've got that angle, we can use that to resolve F2 in the relevant direction. Um, to figure out what that angle is, we can use the fact that the angle between a tangent and a radius uh, of a circle is always 90 degrees, which means in particular 
this angle there is 90 degrees and this angle here is also 90 degrees. So the important point is that you've got a radius vector that goes like this and it rotates around. When it does that, it rotates through an angle d theta over 2, but because the angle between a radius and a tangent is fixed at 90 degrees, when the radius rotates through d theta over 2, the tangent also rotates through d theta over 2, and that implies that the angle that we're looking for um, is also d theta over 2. So now we can start doing our resolving, and we may as well just combine the radial components of f1 and f2 at the same time. So I'm going to write down f1r plus f2r, you can see by symmetry they're going to be the same. And so we're going to have two times something, so two times the radial component of each individual force. Now before we do our trigonometry and actually resolve the force, we need to know the magnitude of each of those forces. And to know the magnitude of the forces, we have to introduce a new parameter, the surface tension at the interface, which is just defined to be the force acting per unit length of surface. We therefore need to know the lengths of all four edges of our area element. Um, those are standard results, so in spherical coordinates, um, if we just look back at the top diagram, uh, this length there is r sine theta d phi, while this length here is r d theta. Those follow just from the fact that for any arc of a circle, the arc length is the radius times the angle subtended by the arc, and also the fact that this grey dashed line on my original diagram has length r sine theta just from trigonometry. So if we call our surface tension gamma, which is the standard symbol to use for surface tension, we're going to get a factor of gamma multiplied by the relevant length. You can see that f1 and f2 are acting on the top and bottom sides which have length r sine theta d phi. So I need to multiply my gamma by r sine theta d phi, then we multiply it by a geometrical factor to resolve it, and you can see from this diagram here that you're just going to get a factor of sine of d theta over 2 to resolve that in the inwards uh, radial direction. Then you use the small angle approximation, because we're dealing with an infinitesimal area element after all, to say that sine d theta over 2 is basically the same as d theta over 2. Um, then this 2 conveniently cancels with that 2, and we can say that this is equal to gamma r sine theta d theta d phi. So we've added together the radial components of f1 and f2. Now we need to do the same thing for f3 and f4. There's going to be one additional step because the directions of f3 and f4 are a little bit less straightforward than those of f1 and f2. To see why it's harder to deal with f3 and f4, you have to picture this really in three dimensions. So this time I've drawn two separate views from different directions of the same element. We've got the top-down view, where by definition of the coordinate phi, you can see that the, uh, the element has angular extent d phi, and so this angle that I've marked there for the same reasons as before is just d phi divided by 2. But then we've also got the edge-on view here, which shows that even after you resolve f3 and f4 in the inwards direction, the inwards direction is now not quite the same thing as the radial direction. So this here is the inwards component of f4, for example, and to make it clear why that has a component in the radial direction, you can draw a little right angle triangle. So I make one side like that, one side like that, and then we make that 90 degrees. You could then use the fact that angles in the triangle add to 180 degrees to prove that this little blue angle that I'm marking on there um, is also theta. So even after we find the inwards component of F3 and F4, we're going to have to project that down using that angle theta onto the radial line. So let's come up with an expression for the radial component of F3 plus the radial component of F4. Again, by symmetry, uh, those are going to be the same. So we may as well start this expression with a factor of 2. Then we're going to need the magnitude of each of those individual forces. To do that, we're going to do the surface tension multiplied by the length of the side uh, that the forces are acting on. So we get gamma, the surface tension. And uh, notice that F3 and F4 are both acting on sides of length r d theta. So I put gamma r d theta. Then we get a couple of different geometrical factors from that resolving that we were talking about. We are going to get a sine of d phi divided by 2 from the top down diagram when we project f3 and f4 um, into the inwards direction just like we did with f1 and f2. But then we also need a factor of sine theta from the edge on diagram to project this f4 arrow down onto the radial line. So we can then do our small angle approximation um, and say that that is roughly equal to, again because the, this 2 and this 2 will cancel when we get rid of the sine, uh, it's going to be approximately gamma r sine theta d theta d phi. 
you'll notice, of course, that this expression is exactly the same as what we got for the radial components um, of F1 and F2. So we could have actually exploited the symmetry of the sphere to say that F3R plus F4R has to be the same as F1R plus F2R and avoided some calculation, but I wanted to just demonstrate that the math does all work out correctly. So then, of course, if you add together the radial components of all four of the forces, and you could write that as the sum of FIR, um, you're just going to get two gamma uh, r sine theta d theta d phi. Um, I'm not really distinguishing between approximately equal and equal to here because we're dealing with a, an infinitesimal element and this is all going to become exact in the limit when the lengths become uh, infinitesimally small. You could now make the observation that the area of that element is just this multiplied by this, which is r squared sine theta d theta d phi, which just differs from this bit here by a factor of r, and therefore you could rewrite this sum of the radial components of the forces as 2 gamma times dA, the area of the element, divided by r. So I think that's the hardest part of this working done. Now what we have to do is consider the balance of forces in the radial direction. We already know that there's an inwards radial force from the surface tensions of 2 gamma dA over r. You also have an inwards force from the external pressure trying to make the bubble collapse. By definition of pressure, that inwards force is going to just be pressure times area, and the relevant pressure there uh, is the external pressure, P out, multiplied by dA. And that has to balance with the force which is pushing outwards. The only force which is pushing outwards is the, uh, the internal pressure. And by the same logic, that force is P in, multiplied by dA. Then, of course, the dA is conveniently cancelled, and you come to the conclusion that P in minus uh, P out is just 2 gamma divided by r. So the conclusion is that for a bubble of gas inside a liquid, the excess pressure inside is 2 gamma over r, where gamma is the force per unit length acting at the surface. So the main result so far is that if you have a bubble of gas in a liquid, there's an excess pressure of 2 gamma over the radius of the bubble um, within the bubble itself. Now we're going to consider uh, the case of a something like a soap bubble floating through the air, which I've described as the thin film case. And so I've just made a couple of alterations to the diagram. We still have a gas inside the bubble with the pressure of P in. This time, uh, the substance outside is also a gas at a different pressure, P out, and we have um, a film of liquid making up the surface of the bubble, although now it's really two different surfaces, one at the top and one at the bottom. Now, fortunately, we can derive the result for this case just using the result that we've already got, we're going to introduce another variable which is going to end up cancelling out, but it's going to be the pressure within the liquid itself, right, within the liquid film. So let's say that has a pressure of P1, doesn't really matter what we call it. Then, using the same logic as before, we can just take our 2 gamma over R result and apply that, uh, that equation at each of the boundaries, right, the boundary at the outer face of the liquid film and then again at the inner face of the liquid film. Now at the outer face the pressure which is playing the role of the internal pressure is not actually P in, um, it's P1. The external pressure would still be P out though, and so P1 minus P out is definitely equal to 2 gamma over R. Then we apply the same equation to the inner surface. Now the pressure which is playing the role of the internal pressure is actually P in. The pressure which looks external is not P out, but it's P1, because that's the pressure immediately outside the inner surface um, of the film. So P in minus P1 is, again, 2 gamma over R. Um, then P1 is the thing that we don't really care about the pressure within the liquid film itself. All you have to do is add together the two equations that we just wrote down. These two, the P1s will cancel because they have opposite signs, um, and you find that P in minus P out is equal to 4 gamma over R. And it's kind of intuitive that we end up just doubling the pressure actually because the only change really is that we now have two surfaces, both of which are going to be pulling equally, trying to make the bubble collapse, and so we've got twice as much force that needs to be balanced as we did in the previous case. The fact that this pressure difference depends on the reciprocal of R leads to um, a result that I certainly found a little bit unintuitive when I first came across it, which is that if you've got two bubbles of different size um, and you connect them via a thin tube, maybe a straw or something like I've just shown in that diagram, and thereby allow the bubbles to exchange gas, um, instead of um, both bubbles sort of equalizing in size, which might seem intuitive, um, the larger bubble will basically consume the smaller bubble because the pressure in the smaller bubble is bigger because it has a smaller radius. And so the pressure within the small bubble will push all of the 
of the gas inside over to the left side and just make the big bubble grow. Just as a final note, I wanted to think about how we can apply this equation to something like a balloon. In other words, is the 2 gamma over r or 4 gamma over r expression more appropriate for a balloon? Now, at first glance, you might think it should be 4 gamma over r because a balloon is more like uh, a soap bubble than a bubble of gas inside a liquid. But if you were to work through the details, you would find that the working for a balloon would actually be exactly the same um, as what we did in our first derivation. So the reason it's 2 gamma over r instead of 4 gamma over r is that we don't really have this concept of internal pressure um, for a solid, right? The balloon is not made of a liquid, doesn't really have an internal pressure in the same way that a solid does, like what a balloon is made from. And so it's the 2 gamma over r expression that you would want to use for a balloon. Although the meaning of gamma, um, I suppose, it's, it's basically the same, but we wouldn't tend to talk about surface tension for a balloon because the tension is not just coming from the surface, it's coming from the elastic forces within the entire volume of the skin of the balloon. So I wouldn't call gamma surface tension in that case, I would just call it force per unit length. Anyway, I thought that was worth mentioning because I am planning to do another video about pressure in balloons shortly, but I think that's all for this time. Thanks for watching and see you soon.